I have to say, coming out of Hotelborg to get your taxi at five or six o'clock in the morning, it's not a pretty sight. And I don't know how many Icelanders actually experienced it, but it is, it is shocking. It really is, is, is shocking. Ja, ef að þú fer á laugardag skuldu, til dæmis ef fyrst og það skuldi í reyki, ef þú sér fullt af ungu fólki sem er fullir. I remember seeing very young girls on high heels who could barely walk and were throwing up from drinking too much. And I think that at the time some of the Icelanders thought it was cute or thought it was funny. I thought it was kind of a problem. Allt land drekka frá föstudagur til laugumenn. Allt land. En svo í studentar segja ekki föstudagur, segja flöskudagur. I was pretty shocked by the Friday night revelry, which goes through to Sunday afternoon. Um, <laughs> I was quite surprised at how kind of um, crazy the nightclubs were. It was like a wild party. Everybody was just inside the discotheque was dancing, and it was it was really good atmosphere. Handsome men stand with each other and drink, and drink, and drink. Nobody's dan dancing and talking with the girls. And then when finally the men try to talk to the girls, they're usually too, too drunk. It is very, very strange. I'm sure it's very good for foreigners, because they go out and all these beautiful women are there, and, and nobody's talking to them, so, so it's an open field for them. And then suddenly, what well, was it, two o'clock, when you're three, okay, closing down and light was turned on. And then, then the, the party continued on the road. The police came and just, I mean, it was totally crazy. I think that um, in Iceland in the last 20 years, they've come around to the idea that maybe a youth and teenage drinking is not such a good thing. And I don't know if it's the change in attitude, but I, I seem to see that a lot less now than I saw it in the 80s. I, it's a great, I think, you know, it's very easy to stereotype Icelanders as, you know, people that just drink lots. And I have to admit, on my travels, a lot of people I met did smell of alcohol, but, you know, they weren't always drunk. I had assumed that there'd be a lot of alcoholism, for example, up there, but when I got there, I didn't find that. In fact, I went to buy a bottle of gin because I like to drink martinis, and it was very, very expensive. And I figured I was being asked to pay for the damage I would do in advance and for my hospitalization. Is that probably what it was? I had no idea how expensive it was. We met yeah. about eight or nine people when we first got there and went straight to a bar and I bought the first round and um, nobody else bought a round. <laughs> I bought, you know, it cost me something, something in the region of about 80 pounds. And I was like, no, you've got, you, you must be wrong, you know? But it wasn't, it was about 80 pounds and then I was sort of sitting back, finished my beer and nobody else offered to buy a beer. It was kind of like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Caught you out. Hey, bless you. I, I, I didn't find a drinking problem. You know, enjoyed the drink. I mean, you know, I think we have a drinking problem here. You know, I mean, if you walk through Soho on a Saturday night, it's not, it's not very pleasant. You know, you'll be leered at, and someone will probably throw up on you. But in Iceland, it, it is still, still seems to be a part of a, a very um, spiritual awakening at weekends. You know, you drink, you drink to wake up in some ways. Whereas here, you kind of, sometimes you feel that people drink to go to sleep. In a small country, uh, you can't afford to have a lot of the commercial entertainments that we have in New York. Uh, and in Iceland, whether it's in Reykjavik, in the bars, or in the small towns, in the bars or in people's homes, you have to make your own good time. Going out, drinking, being with a bunch of people, being loud, listening to music. And, uh, you know, you create that for yourselves because otherwise there wouldn't be anything.
in Iceland. The swimming pools seem to be what in this country are pubs are. In this country where people go to a swimming pool, it's a swimming pool, people go swimming. In Iceland, there are a few guys swimming. Everyone else is sitting around and talking. And obviously everyone knows each other, so, so, so it's a big, big social, social thing. There's an Icelandic smell, actually, too. I think that smell of the sulfur. Yeah, I mean, Icelandic people do smell odd. That's not a bad thing, you know. Because I remember the first time walking into the shower and I just jumped out because I thought, I thought it was something, something wrong. And then they have to clean your teeth with it and say, you know, it's a one, it's just... <laughs> it only smells like that. It looks yellow, though. <laughs> I made the mistake of hitchhiking around Iceland because you don't get many cars. It seems to be an unwritten law of Icelandic roads you know, that you'll only ever meet somebody on a blind heed. <laughs> and then I got picked up by, um, by a fisherman and he said, um, you're going to have to drive because I'm drunk. And... Um, hadn't seen anyone for a good few hours and then I'm in a, in, a, in a jeep with a drunk fisherman. It was kind of odd but very entertaining and um, but you know it, the thought does cross your mind well nobody knows I'm here he could just be taking me to a house and he's gonna chop me up and bury me in his garden but unfortunately they only do that with sharks which I found out later because he had a, a shark which he had chopped up and uh, apparently urinated on buried in his garden and he had it hanging in his garage and uh, he made me eat some in the morning, first thing in the morning, and I was gagging on it. it. It's that really strong, like, ammonia, which I presume is the urine, which is nice. I mean, I think that's when we became closer as friends, the fact that I was eating something that he'd pissed on. You know, that was, that was a beautiful moment between us. We wept together. We were driving across one part of the glacier and there was just a possibility you know, that there might be a crevasse in front of us. So there was a very small chance that we might actually drive down a hole in the middle of the ice and disappear and that no one would ever know where we were there. But given that we had a fantastic GPS system, we'd know to within a meter where it was that we'd all died. So, wonderful. Everybody had a mobile phone and that was a few years ago. You know, I mean, I saw sort of six-year-old kids walking down the streets with mobile phones. I, th I, find, I kind of found that quite strange, that it was a... Especially Reykjavik, really obsessed with technology, and yet, you know, willing to, um, you know, countenance that there were such things as elves that lived in rocks. Yes, I'm sure there's someone in Iceland who's trying to uh, create a digital interface to talk to elves at the moment. Vikings? Well, Icelanders are Vikings, are they? Some of them look like real Vikings in my perception, like strong men and even women. Strong, uh, healthy, uh, big. <laughs> there he was, a huge, strong man who was also a poet. So you've got the Viking saga elements coming into it. I think it's a sort of another lazy stereotype, you know, Icelanders, ooh, they live up there on an island. Don't know why they do that, the odd buggers. So they're, they're, yeah, they're obviously just like the Vikings. I certainly didn't see people walking around with horns on their head, you know, and, and wearing, you know, sheep carcasses and, you know, I witnessed no raping or pillaging whatsoever. Icelanders, Icelandic men are extremely gentle, extremely polite, extremely civilised, which is not something that, that you would associate with, with, with the Vikings. I was always led to believe that Vikings were these huge big men. But when I came to Iceland, I found out that there were these like little men, like Oompa Loompas, you know, and uh, um, that in fact, you know, Icelandic men, I mean, they all look kind of like Elton John, if anything. Oh, hi, come as well. Welcome to Grani Fingur. You have to be able to do it. You have to be able to do They all think that they're all rough and manly, and, but they're actually extremely conscious about the way they dress 
I'm sure they spend lots of time in front of the mirror. They don't have sort of that pastiness to them that many um, urban people, certainly in the States, have. They have more color and uh, I think just a greater sense of vibrancy. It's personified, isn't it, in the character of Beata in the book. I mean, that's just, that's just brilliant. I mean, you do meet Icelanders like that, you know. Well, when you talk about the Icelandic modern man, I mean, we're talking about prehistory here. Um, I didn't really meet very many modern men. I, I'm wonderful modern women. I mean, I thought uh, the Icelandic woman was, I mean, sexy, sassy, intelligent, um, independent, all the things the English long for in a woman. And beautiful but liberal men. I don't think it's an exclusive to the women. The Icelandic man, he reminded me of the Flintstones, the cartoon. I mean, he was fairly primitive, um, charming, <laughs> shy, sensitive, perhaps oversensitive, um, and probably completely horsewhipped by modern Icelandic women. What have these men done to deserve these gorgeous women? And I couldn't see that they'd really got the, what it took to entitle them. Hey, mama, this that shit that make you move, mama. Get on the floor. Yeah. 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 Yeah.